Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We're so glad you're joining with us today and a happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Uh, we hope and we pray that you have a wonderful weekend with family and friends, taking time to enjoy meals together and just uh, reflecting on what you are thankful and grateful for. I want to take a few minutes, let you know some things that are coming up in the life of our church, as well as some incredible outreach uh, opportunities we have during the month of October. So just a quick reminder, end of this month, trunk or treat, fantastic event, parking lot full of hundreds of people as we serve our community, way too much candy and chocolate. If you're interested in either in either hosting and decorating a trunk or in just simply being a volunteer on site that night, uh, please talk to anyone on staff or check out um, any of our socials for information on how to get involved. As well, uh, ladies, your Gene event coming up next Monday, October the 17th. As always, it's a phenomenal time to come together to connect with other women, to hear uh, testimony and stories of how God is working in people's lives, and to share some really good food together. That's next Monday, October the 17th at 7 p.m. Men, haven't forgotten about you. More details coming very soon for a men's event that's coming up in November for all of us. Uh, now, as it is Thanksgiving, we often like to spotlight some very specific outreach opportunities at this time of the year, uh, things that we'll be, uh, we'll be focusing on over the next number of weeks. So we actually do have two opportunities that you know about today. The first is Operation Christmas Child. We launch this uh, every year at Thanksgiving. If you're unfamiliar with Oper Operation Christmas Child, uh, it's something that goes around the globe, is well known throughout the world, uh, where we pack shoeboxes full of Christmas gifts uh, for kids around the world in a variety of uh, impoverished nations where kids are not necessarily going to be celebrating Christmas or be able to have uh, gifts on Christmas morning. Uh, so we encourage our church, if you would like to, we have shoeboxes available. You can pick them up. They need to be returned to us by Sunday, November the 13th, so we can get them into our local distribution center for collection week. Uh, if you check out our website, Facebook, weekly email, uh, or just go to type Operation Christmas Child in the Google search. Plenty of information on what you can pack, what you can't pack, how it all works. Of course, talk to any one of us. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years. We'd love to let you know more about how it works. But Operation Christmas Child, we just encourage you, grab a shoebox, pack it with your family, bring it back. We'll get it sent off. Uh, second thing is this. A night shift is a local outreach uh, in the Surrey area that, that feeds and cares for the homeless in our community. Uh, it's something that's been around for a number of years. And uh, we have an individual in our uh, church, Sam Leeson, who is organizing a donation drive through her work and also, also through our church for Night Shift. So if you go to our website or Facebook weekly email, we'll have a list of the items that they are in desperate need of right now, uh, certain food items, coats, jackets, blankets, clothing items, etc. We'll make sure that, that list is, po is posted everywhere and very clear to find and access. Uh, it's as simple as then. If there's something on the list you can provide, bring it on any of the upcoming Sundays in October. We will have a, a basket uh, in the lobby you can put your donation into. And uh, Sam will make sure that all those donations get to Night Shift as part of we're going to do a three-week uh, drive uh, donation drive for Night Shift Ministries. Uh, any questions on any of those things? Contact the church office, talk to anyone on staff. We'd love to let you know more about what's going on. So, uh, But make sure uh, this time of year that you get involved in some outreach and some giving back to our community. With that, uh, I'm super pleased to announce our guest speaker for today. Would you please join me in welcoming Pastor Tom back to, uh, back to our online video as if we bring the Thanksgiving word for today. Church starts now. What a privilege it is for me to be able to speak uh, to to us as a, as a church again, and um, I have something that is burning on my heart. And as we come into Thanksgiving, I want to talk to us about: Are we entitled, or are we grateful? Now, I want to just make a little disclaimer. My my good friend Dave Veach and I, who we are both retired and we've been friends for uh, decades. And he made a statement, he says that as we get older, it's easy for us to just to be grumpy old men. So I want to make sure that as I share this with you, this is not meant to be a grumpy old man. It's not meant to tear a strip off of anyone. But it is wanting us to take a really good look at where are we living in a world that is sucking us into a way of thinking that I think is destructive. So I have entitled this, entitled, that's funny, entitled this, I've entitled this, uh, is, is, are we entitled 
or are we grateful? Let's pray. Father, as we share together today, I pray, Lord Jesus, that I will be able to share my heart as this has really been life to me. And I want to make sure that in my communication of this, that it is life to us all. We, Lord Jesus, have so much to be grateful for. As we come into Thanksgiving 2022, it is a day set aside, but it is meant to not be only a day, but it really should be someplace that we live, that we live a life of gratitude. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, in my almost 66 years, that I hear lots of talk about kids being entitled. And I would like to suggest to you that all of us, of all ages in all places, not just kids, can feel entitled and think the world revolves around us. Now, in characteristic fashion, I went to the, the uh, dictionary, and I went to the old-fashioned one. I've got this Merriam-Webster Red 1976 edition that I carried with me when I was going back and forth to UBC. And it's just something about tactile. And what's wonderful about it, it is it has all the etymologies all in one place. Here's the definition that I got off the internet, the contemporary definition of entitled. Believing oneself to be inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. Now, surprise, surprise, uh, Merriam-Webster's 1976 had did not have anywhere close to that definition. It was it didn't even exist. So that word has morphed into meaning something that it didn't mean a few years ago. I think the issue still existed, but we now have a word for it. Now I want to just say this: that contrary to public opinion, that the world doesn't revolve around you. And no one owes you anything. Now you say, well, what do you mean about that? Well, I want to unpack that. So I want to paint a picture of my understanding of entitlement. Self-entitlement, I should be more specific. Entitlement is selfish and self-centered. Entitlement believes you deserve more than others. Entitlement demands. Entitlement gives rise to unrealistic expectations. Entitlement succumbs to what have you done for me lately? Entitlement is an expression of greed. Entitlement is stingy and resentful. Entitlement fuels inappropriate anger. A self-entitled person is psychologically fragile. Now, I was a little bit nervous about putting that in there, but here's what I'm saying. The more at the center of the universe you or I are, the more unhealthy we are. So this is painting this picture of this sense of entitlement that I think is sweeping the world. So Alicia, my third daughter, she's a high school teacher. And uh, she comes home and, and we have to laugh or we cry about parents that, why didn't you give my son or daughter an A? Well, they didn't turn in their work. Well, they should have gotten an A anyways. So we have this sense of entitlement. And it, we, it's something that I hope that we can identify in our own lives and that we can do something about making sure that we make the shift from living in entitlement where I deserve something to being grateful for I have received the love and mercy of God, not because of anything that I inherently have coming to me, but because God is indeed good and loving. I want to ask this question, and we'll pick up on this later. Is there a difference between thankfulness and gratefulness? They are often seen as synonyms, which means saying the same things, but I propose to you today that there is a subtle and yet important distinction between being thankful and being grateful. Now, one of the responses of thankful is, is important here is that I believe that thankful, when you're thankful for someone, something, you say, well, thank you, that's a response. But the other Gratitude or being grateful is a state of being. It's a lifestyle. It is, it is something that transcends something nice that is done in an immediate context and us being grateful for the fact that we have been gifted and we have received so much 
that we need to be people who live in gratitude. Now, I did, again, go back to the 1976 Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and uh, there is this understanding that gratitude is something that we are to live in. And I was talking with Kevin Amber, who's part of our church, and he made a distinction. He said it's almost like uh, there's, you know, happiness and joy. Happiness is something, well, I feel happy, but joy is something deeper that you, in the midst of difficulty, you can be joyful even though you may not be happy. And so I want to say in the same way that thankful is a good thing, but we want to move from being thankful and we want to move into being grateful. And I would say that a grateful heart is a thankful heart. A thankful heart is a grateful heart. And I want to just go through here that as I went looking at this deeper, is that being grateful is appreciative of benefits received, and we can express gratitude. It is showing expre expression for kindness and being thankful. And it's interesting that it comes, great graciousness, or I should say gratefulness, and gratitude comes from the same root as the word grace. And grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, is we receive grace not because we have done something or earned something, but we have received grace upon grace because God is a God of love. Now, I want to turn to uh, Luke chapter 15, and uh, I'm going to just read this. It's a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture, and I'm hoping that you will follow along with me. And this parable of the lost son is sandwiched in between this chapter that it talks a lot about lost things. And I want you to know something, that God is looking for lost people. He's looking for things that have been lost in our life, and I believe... My hope is, is, as we look at this story of the lost son, that we will see we want to make the shift from being demanding to being grateful. So let's look at it. So here's what it says. It says, starting in verse 11, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after this, the young son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. I, I really like the King James. It says riotous living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have said this, I am no longer worthy to be called your son, Make me like one of your hard men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. For he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine who was dead is alive again. And he who was lost is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has, he, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. When this son of yours, emphasis intended, 
who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home. You kill the fatted calf for him. The father's response. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I now have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and alive again. He was lost and he's now found. Now, I w- I'm going to follow the pattern of Jesus. Jesus would tell the story and then he would unpack it. So I'd like to do that now. I would suggest to you that the actions and the attitudes of the younger son are revealed in what he does. The son did not appreciate what his father had provided for him. He had grown up in the lap of luxury, thinking that somehow this was just always there and somehow he deserved to be waited on. Because of this, this lack of understanding or gratefulness for what the father had provided, the son demanded from his father what he felt was his due. He said, give me. Entitlement makes demands. Now, the younger son, when he demanded this of his father in that culture, let's read between the lines what he was saying, and it's not a stretch. He was saying to his father, when are you going to die, you old coot? I wish you were dead, and I demand my money now. Demand entitlement as opposed to waiting. And, you know, one of the things I've observed is that temptation, this is a little aside, but temptation is often a shortcut to getting what you can get now instead of waiting for for when it's the right time and when it is really a value and it has accrued much others, much other things. So he demanded it. And because he had no regard for his father or regard for himself, he squandered his father's wealth and his inheritance on wild living. And this is reading between the lines, but when when the party was over, where did his, quote, friends go? You have friends when you have got money. When the, fr- when the money stops, if you're there for the party, he was alone and he hired himself out and he was relegated to taking care of pigs. Now, for a Jew, a pig is the most unclean animal. And my mom's people were pig farmers in Iowa. And let me tell you that um, they're smart, but they're pigs. And they stink, and they love to roll around in the mud. And so, again, here was this Jewish man who I'm sure had grown up eating kosher and you know, keeping the law. All of a sudden, he's so hungry that those pods that the pigs are eating look good for him. Now, when he ended up broke in the pigsty, eating pig food, he came to his senses, the Bible says, and the stark reality that his father's servants were better off than he was. He was a son living in a pigsty, taking care of pigs, and here his father's servants were well-fed, well-dressed, and they were the recipients of the kindness of the master. So when he traveled from give me to make me as one of your servants, something began to change in a good way. Now we see the father received him and restored relationship. We're going to get to the father. I'm just looking at the son right now. This son had been rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. This is what I'm going to say because it was important and it re- it reflected the fact that he had gone from entitlement to recognize that he was unworthy to receive anything and he was throwing himself at the mercy of the father. Now, relationship with the father was restored, but there was a consequence. The boy lost his inheritance. But in the end, I propose to you that this young man, he realized that relationship was far more valuable than any material possessions that he could have. Now, let's look at the, the, the father, the, the actions and the attitude of the father. Now, as a father, I tried to put myself in this. And I said, what would I do if one of my girls, they did not, came and says, look, 
Mm-hmm. You know, I want what uh, what's coming to me now, and I and I want I want what what you know, I want you to divide up the the inheritance, and I want my share. So I asked myself the question: Why did the father give the young boy this money? Now I would suggest to you it wasn't that the father was weak, but I think it reveals just how wise and understanding, and he was willing to take a risk at great loss so that his son would come to understand the importance of being grateful. He allowed his son to take the money, knowing that it was not going to be good for him, but he did it anyways. And I think we see in this the love of the Father, the Heavenly Father. I believe that God is really concerned about our attitudes because our attitudes then get translated into actions. And I believe that that God the Father, sometimes he says, okay, you want to do that? It's not going to work out well for you. But I know my dad would do that. Sometimes he would recuse himself knowing full well that there was, be, there was going to be a train wreck, but that he was there to pick up the pieces. Why? Because he was gracious and he loved me. He learned the hard way this boy did, even at the peril of his life, in hopes that somehow he would come through this. Now, even parents can have a rebellious and entitled child. So just so you get, I told you I don't want to be a grumpy old man. That that there, when I was growing up in the Christian community, there was this myth out there, this untruth, that somehow if you did everything right, that your kids were going to turn out right. Well, wouldn't that be nice? But there's still this wild card of free choice. And if we're going to criticize parents for having rebellious prodigal sons and daughters, then we also have to criticize God the Father because he's got a lot of rebellious kids. So let's give this this, uh, father a pass that he did not create this, but somehow this young man began to develop this attitude of entitlement. I deserve. And yet he came to the point where he says, Make me as one of your servants. There was a humility there. The father showed unconditional love. He was watching the boys return. Now, in in our home groups, I like doing, make this little movie. And so what I see is that the father, he saw the son traveling from a far distance. And so reading between the lines in my movie, I believe that every single day that father went out and he was there at the gate and he was looking to see if his son would return. Every day, he would get up and maybe the mother, the, the wife would say, what? You know, he's not coming back. You're just wasting your time. He says, I've got to do this. And so day after day, he says, maybe this will be the day when our son will return. What an expression of love. And it says, and he was a far distance, it says that the father ran to the son. Now let's go back to some culture. In Jewish culture of the first century, older men did not run. It was undignified. And yet, this father hitched up his robes and he ran to his son, not to dump on him or to take a strip off of him, but he ran to his son and it says that he embraced his son and he kissed him. The father showed forgiveness and relationship, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. So running, running through this, winding through this, there's this thread of the fact that we are the recipients of great grace. Grace upon grace, the Bible says. And that when we understand that grace has been given, not because we have earned it, but because of the love of Father God, what other response can there be other than that we are grateful and we live a life of gratitude. The father was also willing to take on the elder brother in his bad attitude. Now, here's what happens. Here's the older brother in his own way. The older brother was also entitled, lost, and wasteful. He was the dutiful son. He was the son that says, look, I was out there slaving for you. See, he wasn't understanding the great benefit that the, that the father had given to him. And he really did not have a very, a very good relationship with fa- his father. He's saying, I, look, look I, why are you doing this? You know, this kid was out there. He was wasting his money on things that shouldn't have been wasted and blah, 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 blah. 
And, you know, and when I, you didn't even give me even a lamb so I could have a party. And here you've thrown this big party. I would suggest to you that the, that the older son, though he didn't go to the far country, I would suggest to you that he was every bit as entitled. Entitled to his bad attitude and to his judgments and saying, look, I'm better than him. And yet you didn't do this for me. So we, there were really two lost sons. But the father showed unconditional love in watching for his son's return. The father showed forgiveness and the importance of relationship. My son, who was lost, is now found. He was dead and is now alive. Wow. He didn't lecture the boy. We don't read anything in this, this, this story that Jesus told that the father, you know, was like, hey, this is all great, but after the party, there's going to be the day of reckoning. But we see here just the, the love of this father, which I believe correctly reflects the love of Father God. This second son, he wasn't grateful for his father, nor did he understand the father's heart. He did not understand living a life of gratefulness and grace. I wonder, would he have been happier if the son had stayed with the pigs to pay for his sin? You see, this is again coming back to this thing. This isn't me banging on about entitlement. But see, I would suggest to you that the second son was untitled. He did not understand. He did not have a heart of graciousness and gratefulness all he could see was his, his brother's shortcomings. And maybe, well, you hurt the father. Are we living in a place of entitlement where we think, well, of course God is going to give me the, the first cheer. Of course this is going to happen. Or are we saying we receive what we have. We are grateful. We are thankful. We are grateful. We live in gratitude because we understand that God in heaven loves us. And that he is the one who has provided for us. And again, that's a whole other situation. But the Bible says that he would supply our needs, not our wants. And so sometimes we say, well, why don't I have a new car? Or they took a nice holiday. Or they were just away. Why? Where did they get all this money? And I deserve them. But the reality is that this young man came back. He lost his inheritance by his own admission. But he understood that relationship was the most important thing. And he came back with a heart of gratitude. And he obviously knew the heart of the father because he came saying, Father, would you please receive me? And the father immediately embraced him. I would also suggest that the attitude of the elder brother points to materialism instead of what was really important, relationship and forgiveness. <clears throat> so here's the application. So what would need to change in our attitudes, and the R includes me, and behavior, where do we see the need for some adjustments? How am I, how are you relating to the generosity of Father God? So I think it starts with taking an attitude check. And I'm the first to admit that I, I put my pants on one leg at a time. I have a fallen nature just like you do. And this entitlement is so insipid. It just weans, works its way into our thought processes, which then get translated in behavior. That starts with understanding that we don't deserve anything. What we have received is because God loves us. We need to recognize what God has done for us and that we deserve nothing. And somebody says, well, I hope he gets what he deserves. Well, I'll tell you what, I hope I don't get what I deserve. <laughs> and I don't think you want to get what you deserve either. We're fallen. We can be selfish. We can be all those things that I talked about, what entitlement looks like. So what happens is the, the, the antidote to this virus of entitlement is, is understanding that we are the recipients of the love and grace and provision of Father God. It's both that simple and that hard. But to embrace that, we have to go from give me to make me. Do we appreciate what God has done for us? Are we 
entitled, demanding, or grateful for God's great love, grace, and mercy. Now, we are not grace, great, grateful by nature. If we are to develop a heart that is grateful, we will do so because we make conscious choices to say no to that monster of entitlement. And we say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you that when so many don't have something to eat, I do. The sun came up this morning. It rains when we need it. Here's the good news, and I'm just about done. The good news is, even as being ungrateful is a part of our fallen nature, being thankful is a part of our new nature in Christ. I have some some little short statements I want to leave with. Gratitude begins where the sense of entitlement ends. Gratitude begins where my sense of entitlement ends. Where my sense of entitlement ends. A thankful heart is a grateful heart. And a grateful heart is a thankful heart. And a heart of thanksgiving and gratefulness flows from the Father. So I'd like to pray with us. And I want to turn the corner and say, I hope that you heard that this is a wonderful, wonderful message of how we can really come to appreciate and live a light, a life of gratefulness and live in gratitude. And I'm really committed to doing that. And it doesn't mean that I'm always happy. It doesn't mean that, you know, that sometimes it doesn't creep up. It says, why is it so hard? But we can press in and we can understand that gratefulness is the hallmark of a person who understands and is thankful for what Jesus did for us. So I'm going to pray. So Lord, I thank you for this Thanksgiving weekend. And Lord, I thank you for what you've revealed, I hope, to those that have heard this message. All I know is that I choose to walk in gratefulness. I choose to live not in grief, but in gratefulness. Gratefulness for years of being in relationship with the one I loved. Grateful for the fact that I've had the privilege of being born in North America. To quote Danny Hunt, we won the, the birth lottery. Grateful that our sins are forgiven. Grateful that we have relationship. Grateful that we have community. Grateful that we live in a country where we are still free to express our, our, our love for you. I pray, Lord, that you would set us free from a sense of entitlement and let us be hyper aware when it rears us ugly head. I pray this in Jesus' name. Now in closing, maybe you're here watching this and you've never made a decision to accept Jesus. Maybe you need to go from give me to make me, Lord, one of your servants. But he's saying, no, I'll make you my, your son, you my son or daughter. You could say, Jesus, I, I receive that I, I, I need you and I, I, I have fallen short, but I receive your love and grace your riches at Christ's expense, and I invite you into my life. And when you do that, you can tell somebody that. And if you're here and you said, I've already done that, but maybe you've slipped. And I pray, Lord, for those who have embraced a life of complaining instead of a life of thankfulness, a life of entitlement instead of gratefulness. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would renew our relationship with you. Father, you're there waiting to just enwrap us in your arms. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us not just on this Thanksgiving, but for forever to live like this. Amen. God bless you. Let's live in gratitude. Here we are. It's Thanksgiving Sunday, 2022. How fitting it is that we would do communion on this day. Now, in liturgical churches, we call it communion. It's sometimes called the Last Supper. Or, or, you know, but what it's interesting in the Greek, it's Eucharista, which means giving thanks. So today, you and I, we have the privilege of celebrating the great grace of God for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that he made it possible that when we were far off can be brought near. And so the Bible says that Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And as often as you eat this bread, you remember my death until I come again. Jesus 
very God took on human form. And this represents his body, that it was his body. He died, his blood was shed for our forgiveness. He paid our price. We have much to be thankful for. So as you hold your portion in your hand, would you join with me? Dear Jesus, we are so thankful and we are grateful that your great grace was poured out on the cross. That as far as the east is from the west, that's how far our sins have been forgiven. So Lord, even now we would confess that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the free gift of salvation is available to us because of what you did. So Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for what you've done for us. And we are truly grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take it. Let's eat it. Let's do it in remembrance of Jesus. The Bible says, in the same manner, he took the cup, which meant that he took it and he held it in his hands. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which has been completed for you. And as often as you drink this cup, you remember what I did for you until I come again. And then we're going to have that opportunity to have the merry feast of the Lamb there in heaven. It's going to be this wonderful party of eternity where we are celebrating and we are expressing thanksgiving, praise, and gratitude. So would you lift up your portion? So Jesus, we are grateful that it says that without the shedding of, of blood, there's no forgiveness. But Lord, we thank you that you who were innocent, you who knew no sin, that you took upon yourself the sins of the whole world, including mine, including all of ours. So Lord, as we drink this together, we are doing it in, in honor and in thanksgiving, Lord Jesus, for what you did. And we are grateful to Father God who extended his arms and that we are, in fact, true sons and daughters. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let's take, let's drink it. Let's do it in remembrance of him. So, Father, we, we close this celebration and we are so grateful and I pray, Lord, that, that on this day and on this time where we partake of communion, would you reveal afresh and anew all the wonderful things that you have provided for us and let our heart's response be, Lord, we are truly grateful. Amen. God bless you.